It's Raven again. Have you ever gotten in trouble at school? Maybe you know someone who has. The reason a teacher or principal has carried out a punishment is almost always because a rule has been broken. Schools have policies and laws that say what students, teachers, and principals can and cannot do. Have you ever been asked to help change or create those rules and policies? Neither were First Nations in the building of the Indian Act and Royal Proclamation before it. Before we dig any deeper, it is important to understand that the Indian Act only applies to First Nations people and not Métis and Inuit people. Now before we can explore the Indian Act, we have to understand what came before it. In 1763, Britain issued the Royal Proclamation. That was 250 years ago, who cares? The Royal Proclamation is important for two reasons. One, it became a set of instructions for the British to settle in Canada. Two, it officially made it illegal for settlers to claim land occupied by indigenous people unless it was purchased from the Crown, or Britain. This meant that people could only buy land from the Crown, who could only buy that land from indigenous people. Why does that matter? The Royal Proclamation recognized First Nations as actual nations, which meant that Britain would deal with them nation to nation in the future. Unfortunately, First Nations were not part of the process of creating this proclamation so they had little understanding of what it meant. Historically, they didn't follow the same belief and practice of owing and selling property as Europeans, and they didn't speak English, which made buying and selling property an unequal and unfair process. This is a perfect example of the differing worldviews of indigenous people and Europeans. Indigenous people were stewards of the land, taking care to protect it, while Europeans looked to own and exploit the land for personal gain. Although the proclamation recognized that indigenous people were being cheated through colonization, no one from Britain worked with our people to stop it from happening. In fact, the proclamation set up Britain essentially as our parent. If the British were the parents, that made indigenous people like children in their eyes. This type of relationship has shaped how the government for over 200 years has treated indigenous peoples. This relationship ignored the fact that people had their own rich identities in place before Europeans arrived. These were not indigenous people or Indians before Europeans. They spoke of themselves and each other using their own language, in their own words. Here is a quote from Canadian Department of the Interior in its 1876 annual report. Our Indian legislation generally rests on the principle that the Aborigines are to be kept in condition of tutelage and treated as wards or children of the state. The true interests of the Aborigines and the state alike require that every effort should be made to aid the red man in lifting himself out of his condition of tutelage and dependence. And that is clearly our wisdom and our duty through education and every other means to prepare him for a higher civilization by encouraging him to assume the privileges and responsibilities of full citizenship. Report of the Royal Commission on Indigenous Peoples, 1996. As many of you have heard from your parents, you need to grow up. This was a message of the laws of Canadian government to the Indigenous people of Canada. The government wanted Indigenous people to grow up by abandoning their cultures, identities, languages, and beliefs so they could become Canadians. The government worked toward assimilation. This means it was assumed all Indigenous people would soon be absorbed into a new Canadian identity. It also assumed that all Indigenous people really wanted to become Canadian. That's a lot of assuming. When you assume, you make an ass out of you and me. Laws like this paved the way for creation of the Indian Act of 1867. The Indian Act is a set of laws and policies brought together in one place under the government's control to assimilate First Nations people.
It created a registry of Indians determined by the government. This was a list of people who were considered Indian and would be under the new act. This list included men who were part of a band, their children, and their spouses. It is important to understand that Métis, Inuit, and non-status Indians did not fall under these laws. This has been a major issue since the act was put in place as it left these groups to fend for themselves in a new kind of no man's land of a changing landscape. But in January 2013, Métis and non-status Indians won a court case that says they are now Indians under the Canadian Constitution. This will change the way they relate to the government of Canada, as they are still part of the Métis Nation, but affected by laws differently. The Indian Act is far too complex to explore every nook and cranny. Let's take a closer look at a few major points and some of the changes that have occurred over the years. In 1885, the Indian Act was changed to ban many traditional indigenous ceremonies, like the potlatch. This was a way for the government to disconnect indigenous people from their cultures. Even though ceremonies were banned, many resisted by finding ways around the ban, practicing in secret or ignoring it altogether. These bans were finally stopped in 1951. The Act expanded enfranchisement. This was just a fancy way to say that it had a law where men could give up their status as Indians and become British subjects. If they did, their wives and kids lost their status as well. Also, the Act made it so women lost their status if they married non-status men. Enfranchisement was another way for the government to civilize Indigenous people. It is also just one example of a system of discrimination created by the government. The Act gave the power to the government to move people off reserves near town with populations above 8,000 people. This gave the government more power to control how and where First Nations people lived. The Act made it so reserves could be divided up into lots, much like they are today, by the government. This was a way for the government to move people away from community living and sharing of the land they were responsible for stewarding, the land they traditionally hunted on and cared for. In 1969, the government tried to replace the Indian Act with something called the White Paper. It would remove all land claims and the few rights we had under the Indian Act. Too many people opposed it and it never became law. It wasn't until 1985 that the Indian Act was changed to erase some of the big pieces of discrimination. These changes made it so First Nations could vote without giving up their status. This was the end of enfranchisement. As a result of the changes made in 1985, women no longer lost status for marrying someone without status. The Indian Act has a complicated history. It began as a way to force First Nations people to abandon their culture and identity and blend into European society. It was supposed to be temporary, as the government assumed people would eventually give up their history in favor of a new future. They didn't expect us to fight for our culture, identity, and land. The Indian Act challenges people because while it still gives the government too much control over First Nations people and the lands they live on, and makes it difficult for First Nations people to improve economically, it also contains some legal protection that is difficult to give up at this time. Despite the best efforts of the government to destroy Indigenous culture and identity, it failed. In 
Certainly, the act had devastating negative effects on indigenous way of life, but cultures, languages, and identity live on today and are growing stronger.